to all the moms. Moms of children who are still at home or all grown up. Moms who've outlived a son or daughter. Or moms of babies they never got to hold. Moms who've raised kids all on their own or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Gateway Church. Sick. I'm excited that you're here. Um, in Psalm 118, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And then halfway down, it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Talking about Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, who we are going to sing about and praise and worship today in this place. So I encourage you to, um, um, first off, grab a connecting card, and if you have a prayer request, um, please put it on that connecting card. Um, they are prayed for in the back. Our ushers have them coming around. Um, praise, uh, prayer requests, thanks from your heart, um, anything, uh, throw that on the card and it is prayed for. Um, and uh, welcome online. Um, we're glad you're here. Please, if you have any prayer requests online, please um, um, fill out a card, send an email. Um, we want to hear from you. I'm going to give you a second to just uh, fill out that card and uh, put your prayer request down. Says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Why don't you stand with us as we worship our Savior Jesus Christ? And, and as you stand, why don't you give a fist pump or a high five or a hello to somebody around you? We are here to worship together as a body of believers. Um, so say hello, give a smile.
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. in time of need. Um, you are our, our refuge, and we, we look to you and turn to you in all that we do. We thank you, Jesus, for being our cornerstone, and we, uh, we just uh, worship you here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Have a seat. Um, our ushers are going to come along and collect the collecting cards at this point in time. So please have those out ready to go. And um, I, I see some of the kids got the message already. But uh, kids, uh, grades 2 and 3, portable 1, grades 4 and 5, portable 3, um, have fun in Sunday school. And at this point in time, I'm just going to direct your attention up to the screen for our video announcements. Good morning and welcome to Gateway Church. My name is Jenny Smith and we are so glad that you're here with us today. I don't know about you, but one important spiritual discipline that I've personally been learning more about lately and have often found to be more difficult is the importance of carving out time for both silence and solitude with the Lord. Gateway has a ministry partnership with Three Crosses up in the Muskokas and we want to invite you to investigate what a weekend away could look like for you. The Three Crosses Retreat will be taking place over May 27th to 29th. Head over to the website for details and to register today. Here's Brad to tell you a little bit about his story and experience with Three Crosses and what you could expect for a weekend away. It was such a special time. Being at Three Crosses, for those who've been there, it's a special spot. There's um, kind of devotional biblical trails and landmarks. Um, they've actually have a replica of the tabernacle there now. Uh, which is really cool. And so it, it all helps you draw near to God. And um, the Lord really met me in some new cool ways and spoke to me with things that I never expected to hear from him about. But overall, I spent time praying, journaling, reading, uh, went on some walks and just enjoyed God in his creation. At one point in the evening, on the Saturday evening, I just sat on the chair overlooking the lake and just absorbing in uh, God's goodness and His grace uh, for me. And um, so this is a much needed thing for me and I highly recommend it to, to anybody of any age. I'm gonna make it something that I do every six months because I just know it's, it's important to my soul care. You may have noticed the fun yard signs coming into the church parking lot today, and we are so looking forward to our special camp day event coming up soon in partnership with Forest Cliff Camps. There will be lots of fun and exciting camp activities, as well as inflatables, the rock wall, gaga ball, so much more. There's no cost involved, and it is literally the perfect glimpse into what will be taking place in August during our summer day camp weeks. Invite a friend, come on out, head over to the website for details. You've likely heard us talk about the food drive over the last couple of months and the big day is just around the corner. We are so grateful for the 26 routes that have already been filled. And today is the last opportunity to fill the remaining 10 routes that are left. We are so close. I'm gonna be in the cafe after each of the services this morning. If you'd like to learn more or sign up to help, I would love to connect with you. If you're being impacted by what God is doing here at Gateway and you would like to partner with us in making a difference, the easiest way to do that is to head over to the website under the Give Back tab. There you can set up a one-time gift or regular ongoing giving, but either way, every single thing that we do as a church here is made possible by your generosity and our partnership together. So thank you for your faithful giving. We hope you have a wonderful week. Well, good morning, Gateway, and a special welcome to our online friends here in the second service, and a big, big welcome and huge Mother's Day to all of our moms who are here today. We love you, Mom, not just because of what you do for us, which we appreciate, but who you are. So uh, before jumping into the message today, I want to just acknowledge, and many of you know this by now, but my wife Krista and her family are going through a very difficult, difficult time. And um, an email was sent out earlier this week, uh, so I won't go into the detail, uh, details of that situation, partly because uh, everything I seem to say shows up in uh, <laughs> the, the TV news kind of stuff. So um, just want to say that Krista is doing about as well as you might expect under the circumstances. She is feeling understandably overwhelmed. And we just appreciate so very, very much all of your support, all of your prayers, hearing from you. Uh, we just feel lifted up by your prayer support. And uh, God has been good, has been faithful. I do not know how people go through a situation like this 
without the Lord. And uh, if you'd like to express your care or you just have any questions about it, because this is the first time you've heard of it, please direct your questions to me instead of Christopher now, if you don't mind. We would love to hear from you. My email is steve at gw.church. <clears throat> you can come and talk to me after the service. I'll be standing right here at the front. And um, if you'd like to ask any questions or uh, give any condolences uh, uh, about what's taking place. So, uh, Today is the second week of a series that we're calling Send Me, and that's the title of our series. It comes straight from the book of Isaiah, where the prophet describes his calling into ministry, where God calls him to share the good news of, of, God's, uh, of God's love. And if, if you know this, it's not just Old Testament prophets, it's not just missionaries or pastors that God calls into ministry or get, that God sends. God sends all of his children, gives us spiritual gifts that we can use to fulfill the Great Commission to go and to make disciples of all people everywhere. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you uh, this morning to turn to them in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 8 in the NIV. Uh, You'll find it on page 981 in the Bibles that we provide. If you need a Bible, just put your hand up and we'll run one to you. And uh, while you're looking it up, I want to just give a little bit of the context about what you're going to read to begin with. This is a real person we're going to be talking about, Isaiah, here, in a real time, real situation in history. The year is 739 BC. And uh, we know that is the year because that's the year that King Uzziah of uh, Judah died of leprosy. And it's all described in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Um, One day when Isaiah was alone, presumably in prayer, he sees this, this vision within his mind's eye, something that's taking place in heaven. And uh, he sees the Lord in his heavenly temple <coughs> in a place where God is worshipped around the clock by angels. And here's what it says. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings that covered their faces, With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temples filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here here am I, send me. Now, uh, so many of you know that God speaks both in the Bible and throughout history to people. But did you know that because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's still communicating in lots of different wonderful ways. Through scriptures, the way that God mainly speaks to his people today. But there can also be words and thoughts and even pictures that God can bring to mind as we draw near to the Lord in prayer. Now, speaking of pictures, not everybody has the ability to actually see things with their imagination, but the vast majority of us do, and God will sometimes use that capacity to communicate with you. Sometimes when you're asleep, God will bring a picture or even a moving picture to your mind that can comfort, can warn, can can strengthen you, and we call those dreams. But it's true that sometimes when you're awake, God will bring to mind a certain visual, and God calls those visions. So it's not something weird. It's not something mystical or something to be afraid of. It's just communication. It's what you would expect with a God who loves you. So when when Isaiah saw this vision of God seated on his throne, the throne of the universe, he is just overwhelmed by how great God is and by, by how sinful he is by comparison, right? And, um, Look at if you know you're tapping into some kind of communication with God, you think, but you're getting a message about just how great you are and sin free you are and how deserving you are. You, know, you might want to question the validity of that message because Isaiah, when he sees God, he cries out, Woe to me, I'm ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
So Isaiah sees God and then admits his sin and rebellion. Now, if you're a mother here today, you'll know that these precious kids that God has given you don't need to be taught how to do bad stuff, right? Like you didn't have to teach your kid how to sin, did you, parents? I got a recent issue from the Buckboard News, and there were a couple of examples of this on the funny section. So this is my uh, <clears throat> Mother's Day humor here. One, one mother wrote this. <clears throat> After being told it's rude to call dinner gross, our four-year-old is finding increasingly creative ways to express himself. So this tastes unlucky to me. I like that. This sends my mouth into outer space. I like this one. Cauliflower is, as he pinches his fingers together, this much delicious. <laughs> so one mother also wrote, recently I was complaining that we have too much stuff in our house and we need to get rid of some of it. My four-year-old looked at me dead in the eye and said, you should probably burn it in the oven like our food, mommy. Ooh, ouch. So we didn't have to be taught how to sin, right? How to say mean things. Any mother can tell you that, right? So after Isaiah confessed his sin, it was just really important for him to take the next step and to embrace God's grace for that sin, his forgiveness. And so as soon as Isaiah cries out, woe is me, there's an angel that flies to the altar and, and he reaches out and he takes hold of a live coal and he brings it this red hot burning ember back to Isaiah and, and touches his lips with the coal and then delivers this incredible message. He says, your guilt is taken away, Isaiah, and your sin is atoned for. Now, look, as Christians, it's easy for us to see that this is a beautiful foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for us when he died on the cross. And so we receive God's forgiveness of sins by repenting of those sins and by trusting in Jesus. The altar of the Old Testament um, in Judaism is where pure and clean animals would be taken. They would be killed. They would be burned on the altar. And it would atone for sin. Atonement just means the payment, appropriate payment for wrongdoing. And so when the bull or the goat or the lamb in the Old Testament was killed on the altar, it took the place of the sinner. It made appropriate payment for the wrongdoing of the person who offered that sacrifice. And so this glowing ember from the altar reminded Isaiah that the wages of sin is death. And that the forgiveness of sin is costly. Because that innocent animal had to die there at the altar in order for his sin to be atoned for for appropriate payment to be made for his wrongdoing. And so it's a reminder of what Jesus did later on for each of us when he died. That it was he atoned for our sin once and for all. He took our place. Jesus died our death. The punishment that we all deserved was placed on him. Now, I suspect that uh, that symbolism is reflected now somewhat in communion. And uh, I think it builds a, a little bit on that rich imagery that we find there in Isaiah chapter 6. And so today we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup in communion. <clears throat> These are symbols of, of atonement. <clears throat> Jesus' broken body, his shed blood, atoned for our sin in this new covenant that we have with Christ and this reminds us of what happened in the Old Testament with Isaiah. Isaiah's lips touched a symbol of atonement too, didn't they? But it was a symbol from the altar, a symbol of the Mosaic covenant that represented forgiveness of sin. And so we see in every era <clears throat> that God loves sinners and he invites all of us who are eternally separated from him due to sin to come into his presence and to experience his eternal grace. Last year, our speaker, uh, last week, our speaker, Keith Taylor, put it this way. He said, you're in more trouble than you ever dare to admit, but you're more loved than you ever dare to dream. That's the gospel. When Isaiah saw God in all of his glory, he realized, I'm in trouble because I'm a sinner. But when he confessed his guilt and we turned away from it and turned toward God, he offered 
Isaiah his forgiveness, and Isaiah re received a grace from God, and his sin was washed away. And much, uh, really, the same thing happens today. Whenever a sinner repents, turns away from their sin, and trusts in Jesus, they receive by faith God's grace and eternal life. So here's a question for you to consider, friend. Have you come to that place in your spiritual journey where you've accepted the forgiveness of God that's offered through Jesus? Have you reached out by faith? And have you placed your trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? You know, just the other day, I met over here in the office with a couple of friends, two young men who are going to be baptized. And I explained to them in a nutshell sort of the good news of Jesus, drew it out on a whiteboard as I often do, and I said, look, do you understand what God has done for you through Jesus? And they said that they did. And uh, one of them uh, wandered away after growing up in a Christian home, giving their life to Christ. And, and so he was in this wonderful process of just returning back to the Lord with all of his heart. Like Isaiah, that process of coming back to God after being away from him is, is just you do these two things. You repent of your sin and you embrace God's grace. You repent and believe. But the other young man grew up in a very different context, grew up in a non-Christian home, didn't know about Jesus, and just recently, he gave his life to Christ on November the 24th of last year. But he had to do the same thing that Isaiah did and something similar to what his friend did recently in that he just repented of his sin and embraced the grace of God. The way that these two guys related to the Lord reminds me of something that Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said, that just as you receive Jesus as Lord, you continue now to live your life in him because the way you begin is the way you continue. <laughs> Whether you're coming to Jesus for the first time, enjoying his presence for the 2,000th time. Whether you're receiving Jesus as Lord or continuing to live your life in him, you'll have this lifestyle where you repent of your sin and you embrace his grace. Now in the next verse, uh, the Lord asks Isaiah a question. And, and this is a super important question that God asks all of his children. Once you've received God's forgiveness for your sin, this is the next question. God asks, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? God wants Isaiah to step out of his comfort zone and to communicate, to share that message of God's love and grace with the world. And this too is something that God is asking you to do. How many of you are aware that God has placed you in a very unique situation this week with your workplace, with the people in your neighborhood, with your family, with your friend group, with the people on your social media. You have a calling, friend. You have an opportunity. God has touched your lips too with a burning coal of atoning work in your life. And now he's prepared you to share the good news. But are you willing to open your mouth? Are you willing to speak of the hope that you have? See, this scene is reminiscent of some of the other calling scenes in the Bible that we find. You know, when Moses was called by God into ministry, he was very reluctant. Um, and his response to God's call was different than Isaiah because Moses um, heard God calling him and then he said, here am I, send my brother. <laughs> And so, unfortunately, that's a common response of many Christians today still, is when you hear about God's uh, good news and you receive his forgiveness and then he nudges you to share that good news with other people or to embark on a life of uh, ministry or building your local church or praying for or giving to missionaries, your response will be, that's great, send someone else, Lord. I'm busy, you know? Or... Uh, as we saw last week when Keith Green spoke to us about Jonah, Jonah was called into ministry too, and he was also reluctant, but for a different reason than Moses. So Jonah just hated the people that he was called to. That's the reason he didn't go. See, he didn't think they were deserving of God's grace, and he was right, but he didn't realize that he was undeserving too. And, and Jonah was wrong about all the value that God places on people. And Jonah basically, basically he said, here am I. Send them to hell. That was, basically, that was basically his thought process. And so he ran in the opposite direction of God's calling. 
And again, it's the response of so many of God's children when God says, I want you to reach out to the lost because we just don't love our lost neighbors. Because we don't love the lost people of this world. We say, nah. See, there's lots of reasons why people ignore God's invitation to share his good news. And there are some bad examples. Moses didn't value himself, didn't value the gifts and abilities that God had given him. And then there are people like Jonah that don't value other people in the way God values them. But unlike Moses and Jonah, there's a good example in our text today. Isaiah says, here am I, send me. I'm here. And that's the response that God is looking for, for all of us. Because here's the deal, friends. Once we, like Isaiah, have heard the good news about Jesus, once we have received the forgiveness for our sin, once we have responded to God's grace and trusted in Jesus who died for us and was raised to life again, here's the deal, friends. We are invited into a great adventure of sharing the good news with other people, both locally and globally. Now, in this series, it's my prayer that all of us will say yes to God's unique plan that God has for our lives. A calling that we'll say yes to share God's love with those that we come into contact with. And speaking personally, I'll say this. I wish I'd done this more. I wish I had been more faithful in this area. I'm trying to be as faithful as I can, but I'll say this, that to the extent that I have said, here am I, send me, It has been the most challenging and rewarding thing that I've ever done. And if God is calling you, if he's nudging your heart these days to respond to some area of ministry, you'll never regret saying your yes to his call because it's an invitation into the adventure of a lifetime. Many years ago, so I was uh, was 18 years of age. I just graduated from high school the previous June, and I was working now full-time for my father in his welding shop. And one day I was out hunting on our 100 acres of property and I shot a rabbit. Please don't hate me. And uh, so I, I shot a rabbit, I cleaned it up, I called my youth pastor Mitch and he wanted me to bring it by his place so that we could make rabbits stew and eat it together. Now it's amazing what kind of life change can take place over a bowl of piping hot rabbit stew. Because as we happily consumed the rabbit that day out of the blue, Mitch said to me, you know what, Steve? I think you would make a great missionary. I've been thinking about this. And I was blown away. Because nobody, but nobody saw that kind of potential in me. And I thought about what he was saying. And over the next few days, I prayed about it. And reluctantly, I felt in my heart that God was actually encouraging me to enter Bible college that fall and potentially even embark on a career of ministry. Now, the one night that summer, I was in my bedroom praying to the Lord and pouring out my heart just for his direction. And like Isaiah, I had a, not as powerful, but I had a meaningful encounter with God. I was just like, Lord, should I go to Bible college? And as I asked that question on my knees, I felt the room just almost like the air was sucked out of the room. It was almost as if the room just got strangely still. I wouldn't have even known at the time what to call the experience. Today, looking back, I would say maybe that the Lord's presence was just filling that place. And I cried out, should I go to Bible college? And there was just this powerful sense that accompanied that question for me. And I realized I'm not alone. God is with me. And yes, take that next step. I didn't know what I was saying yes to, but it was the beginning of the most amazing adventure. That September, I went off to Bible college in Regina, Saskatchewan, and for the next four years, I earned a bachelor's of religious education with an emphasis in cross-cultural missions. I was preparing to become a missionary. We call them international workers now with the Christian and Missionary Alliance. In my third year of Bible college, I met this uh, girl named Krista, who then became my wife a few years later. And after uh, four years in Bible college, I went to seminary for three years to fulfill the requirements of a master's degree that the Alliance has for their international workers. I often say I could have been a doctor. And then at the end of that long process, then there's still more time, I went off to church in Mississauga to do uh, what they called two years of home assignment Uh, before they would send you as an international worker, and Krista there finished her degree at Ryerson University. Now look, I'm boring you with all these details about my life, just not so that you can know, here's what happens when you shoot a rabbit. That's not the point, okay? (laughs) 
but be very careful before shooting a rabbit. You want to be careful. Anyhow, I'm telling you this because I want you to know maybe what God could be up to, not just for me, but for you. I want you to know that this is what God has been up to from the beginning of time. God has a heartbeat for the whole world. He's given you a calling, a calling to share the good news. And look, because God loves the world, he can even speak to a scrawny, pimply-faced, 18-year-old welder over a bowl of rabbit stew and put it into his heart to leave the family business to embark on the adventure of sharing the gospel. See what God is up to. He's speaking to people like Isaiah, like you, like me, in all kinds of ways, putting it into our heart to leave a life of stability, to leave a life of selfishness, to embark on a journey, an adventure that reaches beyond yourself and impacts even the furthest reaches of this planet. So friends, some of you, if you're astute, will notice I never got to be a missionary. I didn't get that far, but both of my degrees being in missiology, when it came, it came time for me to head overseas, um, when my home assignment came to an end, uh, there's a number of reasons, I'll just say this, that God didn't call me to go to Russia as I had originally planned. Instead called me to go somewhere a little different, a little place called Caledonia, and to plant a church there. And uh, I often say to people, I'm not really a pastor. If you want to understand me a little, I didn't get the usual pastoral training. I'm a missionary in Canada, and it's the way my brain works. So if you're part of the Gateway family, I just want to say, I hope that's part of your passion too. Often people, I ask them at our intro to Gateway, like, what's it like to come to Gateway Church? If you're new here, what's it like? And I often hear one thing. I'm not just fishing for compliments, but I love it when I hear this. I hear this, you know, there's kind of an outward focus here. Like, there's a lot of emphasis on reaching our friends for Christ, and particularly about getting engaged in missions and reaching the world. There's that emphasis on sharing our faith locally and globally. And I hear that and my heart just sings because it's not just me, it's you. The Lord has been speaking to you too. I don't know if you've been eating rabbit stew. We are all in this together. And I hope that you too will have your own rabbit stew conversation with Jesus where he instills in your heart a passion to share the good news with those who have not yet heard. You know, one way that we can respond to God's call is to partner with our international workers. And uh, so right now, Rich and Elisa Brown, I want to direct your attention to the screens, and we're going to hear from them. They're serving in Latin America. Hey, Gateway, we are Rich and Elisa Brown. We are your international workers. And as you guys know, we are no longer international workers to one country, but we are nomads. We go one to three months in different countries of Latin America with um, the, the goal of reaching the 300 million youth of Latin America. Thank you guys. We are so grateful that you are part of our team. We know that you guys are praying for us. We know that you guys are giving to us. And we also know that you guys are sending people out and even some that come our way. And so we're so excited to give you guys this update today. We are excited to tell you that Nina Wachi is doing really well this year. You guys have been getting some of the updates, but we just wanted to give you the latest updates. Pray for Santiago and Benita. They're now expecting a baby. Pray that everything goes well and they can become parents very soon. Also be praying for each one of the groups. There's language groups that are represented, the Schwad, the Kofan, Waurani have been there before, the Spanish speaking ones, the Quichuas, there's all kinds of different language groups. Pray for each of them that they get closer to Jesus as they serve in the communities where no churches exist. We are right now in Ecuador. Um, we have been in Panama. And before that, we were in Peru. We've got two months here in Ecuador, so we get to go. Right now, we're in the coast. We're at an Inca link retreat with all our missionaries and staff. But soon, we will be going to Ninawachi, and we'll be praying. The staff has been meeting once a week. Uh, they are really looking for more training in leadership, and God has been blessing them by bringing people to work alongside of them, including you guys, and we know that. And we just are so grateful for the prayers that you guys can not only pray for us and for Santiago and Benita and for Ignacio and Maylene, but also pray for Inca Link as we continue to reach the 300 million youth in Latin America. It is one of those things that it's, it takes a relationship. It takes knowing the language. It takes sometimes living out of our comfort zone and traveling all that we're traveling, but it's also bringing Jesus to people who haven't heard. And so thanks for being 
team members for us, for praying for us, but also thanks for giving to the Global Advance Fund. The way that you guys give is supporting international workers around the world like ourselves to be able to serve in reaching people. And also continue to plan about coming. Come not just to not just to preach and to teach, but come to see what God is doing. Come and feel and smell and hear the stories of what God is doing in Ecuador through Nina Wachi. Thank you so much again for being part of our team. We love you guys, and we can't wait to see you in person sometime soon. Uh, God bless you and make this 2022 an amazing year for all of you. Bye, guys. Aren't they great? Don't you love them? They're just awesome. Look, uh, it's a great update, and uh, just God is doing a new thing, and uh, through you as well in our partnership with the Browns. If there's anyone here, though, who's saying, hey, how do I take a couple of steps in this direction of responding to God's call to share the good news? Let me just suggest there's three words, three ways that you could say, send me, and that is pray, give, and go. First of all, pray passionately. You know, pray for the ministries of your local church. Pray for your neighbors who don't know the Lord. Pray for, uh, you know, yourself that you'll be bold in sharing the good news, that you'll get involved in leading and serving in your local church. And pray for our partners in ministry like Rich and Elisa Brown. Remember to pray for them maybe when you gather in your small group or when you get your kids together over the kitchen table. Like, um, uh, Like all of us, the Browns need our support in prayer. You know, there's another missionary family uh, that we have, the Labasus, who've been serving in Cambodia, but they have recently retired from missionary work. Alana is working now as the missions mobilizer in our district, and Bill, uh, I mentioned this before, but Bill uh, is suffering the lingering effects of Legionnaire's disease, and he is doing some part-time work these days, but it's all that he can handle. And um, so this past Friday, just a couple of days ago, Lindsay and Ashley and I drove to Owen Sound to visit the Labazoos, and we laid down on video just some of the celebration of what God has done through that partnership over the last 20-some years, and we'll be, expl- uh, we'll be showing you some of that video next Sunday. You're not going to want to miss it. But please pray for the Labazoos. Pray for the Browns. They need the support of our prayers. What, what, what else can we do? May I suggest that you secondly, go boldly. You know, go to your neighbor, go to your next door neighbor maybe and share with them the good news you have or go and visit somebody that you know who's sick in the hospital. Like do something that just enables you to go and to do something for someone. Lord willing, we'll have opportunities that open up next summer, uh, a year from now that is, for you to consider going on a missions trip. That's really going where you can personally just engage in the work of our international workers. Rich and Elisa spoke about Ninawachi, which is a Bible college for young people in the jungles of Ecuador. This is an opportunity for us to uh, train and equip these indigenous students to go and to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus, to start churches in some of the most remote villages in the Amazon rain basin, to share the good news. Some of these villages have literally no Christians in them and absolutely no access to the good news of God's grace. These are some of the most remote unreached, isolated peoples on the planet. Over the last year, Gateway families have sponsored 160 children from this same area in Ecuador with Compassion International. And the promise that they've made to us is that they'll make it possible for you to go and visit your sponsored child if you're able to go. And so again, I just, inc- I just encourage so many of you to start to consider, would you go on a missions trip next summer? Would you pray about that as a possibility? And then finally, friends, I invite you to consider just giving generously. See, when you give to your local church, you make it possible through things like youth ministry, kids ministry, food drive, uh, camp day, all kinds of things to make a local impact in your community. But we want to have a global impact too, friends. And so on your giving envelopes, you'll notice that we provide you with an opportunity to support our international workers like the Labasus and Browns by giving to the Global Advance Fund. The Global Advance Fund, or GAF, or GAF as some of us call it, is uh, what pays for the salaries of 178 missionaries, IWs, international workers in Canada. This is what prepares the way for 64 active candidates who are in the pipeline right now wanting to become international workers. This global advance fund makes all that possible. You'll find it on your giving envelope. It's a designated fund in the Canada Helps website. At Gateway, we just encourage you to prayerfully consider our missionary work, that it would 
would grow, that it would, that it would flourish. And we suggest as a general rule that if you give $9 to your local church, that you set aside $1 for that global advance fund so that others in other world countries might hear. I mentioned I grew up in the Owen Sound Alliance Church there, and something you may know about that local church is that over the hundred or so years that they've been in existence, there are just many pastors and missionaries that have come from that congregation. Bill Labas is an example. I guess I'm, an, I'm another example. And part of that rich tradition of the Owen Sound Alliance Church where I grew up is that they have always given the most to the Global Advance Fund in our district, as long as I can remember. I mean, since the Lord spoke to me, at least as an 18-year-old, that Alliance Church in my hometown is given the most to missions on an annual basis out of all the other churches in the Central Canadian District. But last year, all that changed. Last year, the Owen Sound Alliance Church gave the second most to the Global Advance Fund in our district. And here's how I know that. I was talking to Alana Labasu, as I said, she's now the missions mobilizer, and I said to her the other day, I'm just curious, which church gave the most to the Global Advance Fund this past year? And she says, I think it was Gateway, but I'll have to check. I said, check. I'd like to know. So she got back to me with an email the next day, and here's what she wrote. I have checked the 2021 report and indeed congratulate Gateway as our number one GAF giving church in the Central Canadian District. Gateway gave $126,000, which is a 44% increase from the year before. How do you like that, friends? Isn't that awesome? And then she writes, I think we should throw you guys a party. I'm still waiting. Please share a huge thank you with your congregation. So that's what I'm doing right now. Now, I'm just, I was so happy that we knocked Owen Sound off their high and mighty throne. I was so sick of sucking their exhaust fumes for so many years that I forwarded that email to their senior pastor, friend of mine, and I wrote in just the friendliest possible way, the gauntlet has been thrown down, my friend. Then I forwarded it to my dad, who has chaired the missions committee there for years, and I said, ha, <laughs> eat our dust, losers. No, I didn't say quite that. But I did, I couldn't help it. I did welcome him to second place. So, of course, let's, let's be honest here. We would be absolutely thrilled if they knocked us off our perch next year, as long as we all continue to grow in giving that others might hear and know Jesus. There is nothing wrong with a little good-natured competition when it's for a good cause. And thanks to our missions team and to those who have served on mission trips over the years. Thank you for all of your prayers and for all of your sacrificial giving. And we invite you to join our missions team if you would like to serve and know more about our missions efforts. It encourages me to no end that there are people around this place, despite pandemic lockdowns, are willing to remember that there are those who don't yet have a seat at the wedding supper of the Lamb. It encourages me to no end that you pray, that you give, and that you go. That you say, here I am. Send me. I think that's exciting. Estimates suggest that there will be one billion people on planet earth that will be born, grow old, and die, and never once hear the name of Jesus. How can that happen on our watch? Thank you, Gateway, for praying and giving and going locally and globally. Let's pray now. Would you stand with me as we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts go out to the Labasus as they retire from missions, not because they plan to do so, Father, but because of Bill's health. And we pray, Father, that you would strengthen Bill and that you would use Alana in a wonderful way as our new dis district missions consultant. We pray, Father, for the Browns and for um, Ignacio and um, 
uh, his wife. We pray, Father, for Santiago and Benita in Ninawachi, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them strength, Father, to build that ministry and to equip young people, indigenous people, to go and plant churches in some of the most isolated places on this planet. Father, we pray that we would fulfill the great commission in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm.
worthy of every breath we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
most important part. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in Amen, church. Amen. Amen. As we close the service, uh, just a couple of things I want to say. Back to that uh, situation that I referenced at the beginning of the service and the challenge that my wife, Krista's family, is, is going through. I just want you to know I'm going to be at the front of the church here after the service. Um, if you have any questions at all, any uh, just offers of um, prayer and care, please come. We would love to hear from you. And um, we just feel like God's grace and God's um, people have been lifting us up through the power of prayer. Thank you so much. And uh, we just declare that God is good and that Jesus is our foundation. We stand upon his goodness today as a family. And we declare that Christ is good. And um, I, I don't know how you go through something like this without Jesus. And if you don't know him as your savior, please come forward today and accept Christ. Our prayer ministry volunteers will be on both sides to pray with you for anything that you need. And uh, please do speak to Jenny today to help us with the food drive. We want to get rid of all of those roots that are still open uh, today. And then uh, just to remind you that there's a missions event at Rexdale Alliance Church on Tuesday this week, if you can make it. And uh, the information about it was available in the newsletter. Um, let me just leave you now with this blessing, friends. May the love of the Lord so fill you this week that his grace bubbles over into the lives of those around you. Amen. And happy Mother's Day.